if someone does something or you don't agree with something, I always recommend shortening the gap between when that thing happens and you feel like I need to say something and when you actually say something. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be aware of how you're currently communicating. Mm -hmm. Is it working for you or against you? So the goal is assertive, I guess. The goal is assertive. Where you're grounded in your communication, you can accept feedback, you can give feedback, you consider people's feelings and their emotions, but you don't take them as a part of yourself. So for me, drinking very heavily from a young age was my was my vice. It was my means of self-protection to suppress different types of trauma that I'd experienced as a child. It allowed for me to feel confident. It allowed for any insecurities that I had about my identity, my race, because I always say I discovered that I was black when I came to the UK. I had no idea. <laughs> I, I've never had to think about it. So suddenly I was hyper aware of my differences and I was told that they were wrong. Do you think we can reframe everything? I think you could with everything. Harvest is in London for a special one day event. Here we gather renowned artists, speakers and practitioners who are all inspiring us with their take on this edition theme tools for transformation. I hope you enjoy this interview. Today, my guest is Africa Brook. She's a consultant, mentor, speaker, and writer. She's a guiding light through uh, the intricacies of self censorship and the myriad ways we often uh, self sabotage ourselves. Uh, she doesn't shy away from uh, the complexities, embracing the glorious and uh, yet the messy parts of our lives. Hello, Africa. Hello. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to be with you. And um, before we started recording, I was just saying I'm excited because it feels like it's going to be a very open conversation. So, yeah. Thank you. Happy. I'm so happy to, to have you here. And uh, I've been listening to your uh, podcast, Beyond the Self, and it's uh, really fabulous. And I've been, I've been advising a lot of friends uh, to listen <laughs> to it. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I know you a little bit. Thank you. Podcast. That's a good start. Yeah. Thank you. So you're talking about um, self-sabotage. Mm-hmm. We're going to ask about uh, this topic. And uh, can you first describe it? Absolutely. So I... And I I like that you asked me to define it because I think to have conversations in a very open way, we need to all understand the definition that we're working with, right? So I would simply describe self-sabotage as when you find yourself getting in your own way. And then I'll add another layer to that. It's when your behavior and what you say you want are in conflict. So you say you want certain things. You say you want to start the project. You say you want to write the book but you always choose procrastination. You always choose delaying. There's always going to be next week, I'll do it on Monday or I'll do it the following week. Before you know it, there's a year that's gone. (laughs) So again, your behavior and your goals are in direct conflict and it's starting to work against you. So that is self-sabotage. And where does it come from? Where, why do we have this tendency to do that? Uh You know what, I, I always make it very clear to my clients and whoever I'm speaking with, that we're not getting in our own way because we hate ourselves, because we just don't want to see ourselves do well. It's a means of self-protection. So we're trying to protect ourselves in a way that is not actually useful because we see it as if there's going to be some kind of pain. There's going to be some kind of um, resistance behind it. So we avoid it, you know. So self-sabotage, yes, it might be you working against yourself, but it's a means of self-protection. And for a lot of us, it starts at a very young age. You know, it's not something that you just begin doing randomly. It's just a means of avoidance. Okay. Yeah. Is it because we're scared also, like, um, to, it's more comfortable sometimes not to yeah. move than to fear of uh, the oh, fear absolutely. of failure? Like, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's the uncertainty, isn't mm. it? I'm afraid that I'm going to fail. Yeah. I'm afraid that people will judge me if I do it. Um, say you've always worked in the corporate world but you actually want to be an artist and you've been working on this music project for a long time and you set a date to say you know what i'm going to release just a few songs and put them out into the world and then when you get close to that date you start making excuses maybe you start another project so never quite following through is a big part of it okay but it's usually pulling the plug when you're getting close to the thing that you Mm -hmm. actually want you know okay so a lot of it is about judgment what will other people think when they've always known me 
as someone that is in the corporate world as a very serious person but now suddenly if I start doing music what if that harms my reputation or how people view me so a lot of it interestingly enough is about how other people will perceive us mm, which is very interesting yeah. but again if you approach it as a means of self-protection it just feels a little bit kinder than to just think it's just me getting in my own way full stop because that can become a, a shame spiral okay yeah do you have steps so how can you uh, fight against uh, this tendency to mm. self-sabotage you know what I think it would be amazing if I had one gift wrapped answer. No. <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> I would give it to you. However, I think it, it depends on so many things. It depends on exactly what it is. So I'll actually say awareness. You need to be aware of where you might be getting in your own way now. Just look at your everyday life. It doesn't have to be a really big thing. Mm -hmm. Is it in relation to your health? Do you want to be exercising more? But for whatever reason, you can only exercise when you're motivated or inspired or you've listened to an incredible podcast. On other days, there are a lot of reasons as to why you shouldn't work out. I'm busy. I've been working eight to eight. There is no time. But somehow you have time to watch the entire series of mm. your favorite show. Of course. You yeah. <laughs> so I think it's worth just looking at the very yeah, yeah. everyday things that are currently happening in your life where you might be in conflict of the goal that you say you want so I'm, I'm going to say awareness before you even start yeah. about changing anything why don't we become aware of the things that are happening that are kind of mm -hmm. you know we're avoiding looking at that thing a little bit yeah. you know the to-do list gets longer and longer and longer and then you start to feel a bit ashamed and then you say no well, maybe I didn't want to do it that much mm -hmm. anyway yeah because you know? sometimes you're very good to hide even yes. that uh our own goal, like uh, what we really want. Like, Absolutely. We're very good to lie to ourselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So mm -hmm. honesty, I think it's about, yes, bring awareness to those things, but be honest about it. You know, how long have you been avoiding doing the thing that you say you want to do? Having the conversation that you know you need to have, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but every single time you delay and you delay and you delay to the point of maybe feeling frustrated with yourself, um, feeling frustrated with your partner, you know, when actually it's because you haven't had the difficult conversation with them. So there's so many different things, you know, that are on the surface self-sabotage, but we're trying to protect ourselves from the discomfort, as you said, from the uncertainty. What will happen if I have that conversation? But also what will happen if I do start working out consistently and then I become a new version of myself? Because it's not always just because we think it's going to be bad. Maybe there's a self-esteem issue. You don't think you deserve to be in a body mm -hmm. that feels True. well. True. So it's, it's very complex. That's why I say there's no neat way. But I think awareness is one yeah, of okay. the first things. Yeah. How does it manifest? You, you talked uh, about it uh, a little bit, like um, about having a difficult conversation mm. with someone. But how does it manifest self-sabotaging in a love relationship? Yes. You know what? It ties into... So my two areas of speciality are self-sabotage, why do we get in our own way, and self-censorship, why do we withhold our truest expression? Yeah. So your ideas, your opinions, your views, knowing that there's something in your relationship that's not quite working, but you never say anything. Instead, you get very resentful, you start slamming the doors, you do mm -hmm. the dishes a little bit harder, <laughs> you know, because you hope that sends the message yeah. instead of having the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you're censoring your truest expression. So I'm fascinated with self-censorship because it's actually a form of self-sabotage. Okay, interesting. Right? Yeah. So that's where the yeah. connection is for me. Because to be censoring yourself and repressing your truest expression, even if it's in the way you dress, you know, maybe you wish you could wear brighter clothes, but again, judgment. What will people think if I suddenly change my style? So you repress your truest expression. So for me, when those two things connect, it's because it's a form of self-sabotaging behavior. Self-censorship is very interesting. So how do you um, mm. do to make, uh, to find, it's a, an amazing and yeah. beautiful and very large question, but uh, yeah. to find out your beliefs in a way, your mm. own beliefs? It's, again, I always come back to awareness because, and I mean, we, we all know this and understand it intuitively, but without understanding the problem you're experiencing, you will never find the solution. You just won't, you just won't, especially if you're not being honest. So with self-censorship, if I'm to give a very clean, clear definition, it's when you withhold your opinions, your ideas, your views, your expression because of fear. 
So that's the key thing. It's fear driven. Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine someone listening to this might think, well, Africa, isn't it just being tactful? Isn't it just me reading the room, using my discernment, knowing what to say and what to not say? No, because self-censoring and having a social filter are two very different things. Yeah, of course. Self-censorship is fear-based, whereas if I am using my social filter, it's from a place of discernment. There's, I feel grounded. I just know that this is not the environment to make a certain joke because it's just not the right audience. There isn't that safety where they can understand where I'm coming from. So it's it's my discernment. We need it all the time, you know. Um, if your aunt has a wonderful new haircut, and she has a short little pixie haircut, and you think it looks a little bit Boris Johnson-ish. You won't say that, okay? You're not self-censoring. Oh, you shouldn't be honest. You're not self-censoring. You're using your social filter to say, actually, she really likes it. And this is someone that I love. So I can admire it and appreciate that they're so happy about it. And it's not going to get me anywhere to try and rip it apart and say I don't... That's discernment, yeah. right? And that's a very simple, uh, non-controversial example. Yeah. So... I really think it's important for people to know that there is a difference. Self-censorship is a specific thing. It's fear-led. So the first thing is about bringing awareness. What are you actually afraid of? A lot of us are afraid that if we speak, especially in the climate that we find ourselves in, right? A lot of us are afraid that if if I say what I truly think and what my view is, I'm going to be misrepresented. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be harshly labeled. I am going to be cancelled if we're going to use the specific yeah, language yeah, yeah. of today, this True. phenomenon, yeah. um, where we believe that people are just going to misunderstand us. The commitment to misunderstanding people is so intense right now. Mm-hmm. So people retract. People just stop speaking. Yeah. They just stop saying what they truly think. So what is your specific fear? What are you actually afraid of? Yeah. And what are the things that you wish you could express in your interpersonal relationships? Are they political beliefs that you think are wrong or someone like you shouldn't have those beliefs? Like, what is it, you know? So awareness is one of the first steps and then we'll go into the next one. You talked about, um, so um, I'm noting that we have to talk about the second step, but uh, what about the things that are not so pretty, we think is Mm. not so pretty in us, that you were talking about political beliefs, Mm -hmm. but there could be like things like, should we accept them uh, because we cannot work on everything at the same time? Yes. But yes. Uh, should we have like uh, accept? What do we do with those, those little things? I think that's why we're scared sometimes mm. also to look at ourselves because oh, I'm not perfect. Yeah. Like, uh, you know what I think? I think something there that I probably don't even speak about enough when I talk about unraveling self censorship is that it actually begins with us rejecting the idea of perfection. We will never be perfect, whether we like it or not. You will never have the perfect views for everyone. Mm-hmm. And by everyone, I mean yeah. 8 billion or just under. There's, you're always going to be misunderstood, depending on the audience, depending on the culture that you're from, depending on the language that you speak, depending on the body that you inhabit, You know, depending on your race, your sexuality, your class, whatever it might be. You will never have the complete right opinion thought or idea or belief for everyone yeah so the chase for perfection is a form of self-sabotage so i think we have like a collective perfectionism where we're trying to have the right belief so i would say while we're still in that phase of awareness who gets to decide if that belief is right or wrong and i say that fully acknowledging that there are things that as a society we all know from a place of common sense this is not right for these reasons But I think there's something deeper when we begin to um, really police and micromanage our most intimate thoughts. When you're around a dinner table and people are having a conversation and they just want to know, what do you think about Mm -hmm. this? And before you even say anything, it's almost like I call it um, the mob in your mind. It's like you have a team in your mind who's kind of managing, <laughs> like getting the files. This is the wrong file. What do we do? So there's like a conflict internally. And mm-hmm. I think that visual can be powerful for it's you to be like, no, actually, no. What do I actually think? You know? Yeah. So I, these conversations can feel very big because we think it's about politics. We think it's about changing the culture. But I actually think it's in those tiny micro moments when someone says, what do you think about this? 
or something again i bring it back to romantic relationships and family and friends because our interpersonal relationships are the best place to see how all of this is working yeah. you know if you if someone does something or you don't agree with something i always recommend shortening the gap between when that thing happens and you feel like i need to say something and when you actually say something Mm -hmm. learn to shorten the gap that's what i do okay so a hot and reaction and it's such a good yeah instead okay. of instead of reacting mm -hmm. but that's that's important though to understand that reacting is usually when you feel a constriction and you feel uncomfortable and then you just say something you okay. get defensive or mm -hmm. what or you shut yeah. down yeah that's a reaction you can take time to respond you can take time to actually take something in maybe you need a few hours you know um if there's an argument that's happening, maybe you need to say, you know what, I let's take some time with this because I can feel that I'm shutting down. That's something that I actually say to my partner. Okay. okay you know, instead yeah. of me reacting, I can mm -hmm. say, you know what, I can feel the specific language I say to him is that I can feel my heart closing. Can we take can we take a little while? Okay. So then it gives me time to actually process my thoughts. Or if it's a dinner conversation and someone asks for my opinion around something that I know is controversial. Yeah. Maybe you have like a devil's advocate character at the table they just yeah, want yeah, to yeah, kind pinch of, you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'll say i'll actually pause i have no problem pausing i think that's the thing we think we need to give an answer straight away super quick yeah super yeah. quick mm -hmm. that's still a form of self-censorship in a way because you're not tuning into what is actually yeah. true yeah you want to please you're people. reacting yeah. so you're pleasing and then mm. you might be agreeing with something that you don't mm -hmm. believe to be true yeah. so i practice what i call the power of the pause Okay. Well, you'll just take a moment and it could even be looking around the room. It could be and saying, you know what? I, I don't have an opinion mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. I think that's a very courageous thing to do yeah. in a world Absolutely. where people want you to choose. Are you left or right with us, against us? Are you pro or anti? To be like, you know what? I don't, I don't have a strong opinion on yeah. this, you know? So for me, that's a way. And again, the little micro moments, it's not about going online and saying something big and audacious and loud. Because to me, that really should not be the main goal of undoing self-censorship and becoming a braver communicator. We get an opportunity in every single conversation, every single human interaction, mm -hmm. to become a little bit braver, to yeah. not censor your voice. You know, if something comes to the table, you go to a restaurant and the dish is too salty, instead of thinking, oh, maybe I'm bothering people. It tends to be women particularly, you know, because we're kind of raised to please and to not, yeah. to not ruffle any feathers. Mm -hmm. um, just say, you know what, this is a little bit too salty. Can I get a replacement for this? Mm -hmm. And you can see the tone. It's about your tone and your delivery. It doesn't have to come from a angry low, place. Yeah, yeah, because if it does, then you will probably censor yourself or react. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a dance with so many different things, but I always encourage people to just look for the tiny little moments in your everyday life. Yeah, to practice where you can being practice brave. Practice being yeah. brave in yeah. how you speak. That's super interesting. Instead yeah. of holding it in. Because when you hold it in, it's going to come out eventually. Yeah. Which is how, I mean, that's a very different conversation, but I think it also contributes to how you get a lot of trolling behavior online. Mm -hmm. Where you might have a normal mother who's a very respected member of society but online she might be a <laughs> troll has a fake account it happens all the time <laughs> and that can yeah. be a result of repressed expression because you're not allowing yourself to kind of have maybe controversial thoughts offline safe in your yeah. friendship group where you can be tested yeah in your ideas where you can with be no challenged yeah with no judgment yeah. you know yeah yeah so the first step is awareness first step is and awareness. i'm following the Good. second step <laughs> responsibility so okay. we've kind of ended up speaking about responsibility a little right. bit you have to become responsible for how you communicate and i always say to people yeah. if i was to ask you what your default communication style do you know what that is would you say you know um it changes i'm adapting to people i guess uh -huh. yeah, yeah but your default oh, my default uh, communication mm -hmm. would be like probably to withdraw yeah okay i'll give you the kind of four main types all right and for anyone watching or listening to this try not to personalize the types we just want to understand what our default is and yeah. then i'll share mine as well so you have passive yeah passive aggressive mm, okay aggressive yeah and assertive 
Okay. okay. So when you're passive, no one ever really knows what your true opinion is. You can mold and shape shift to other people. If someone is intimidating, even energetically, chances are you will take on whatever their beliefs are or okay. whatever they say is true. Yeah. But the thing is, yeah. and you hold in how you truly feel, you probably identify even very loosely as a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. You've always mm-hmm. pleased people. You adapt and mold yourself based on, will this make other people happy? There's a safety to that. It's yeah. all about safety. Yeah, yeah. But again, no one ever really knows what do you actually think, mm-hmm. you know? And it makes you very resentful. Yeah. Because again, you can explode, you're, after you at, can ex- yeah, you yeah, can yeah. explode at, and people won't expect you to be that way, but it's actually parts of you that yeah. haven't been allowed to, to be at the fore, to be in conversation. Yeah. Passive aggressive. You allow yourself to say what is on your mind, but you might say, I'm fine, when clearly you're not. Yeah, in yeah, your tone yeah. and your demeanor. Yeah, yeah. That's the door slamming. That's the kind of whatever it might be. So you show it, but... You, you show it, it, but it's yeah. it's it's ambiguous yeah, in yeah. how you communicate, okay? And you might tend to use sarcasm. Maybe you allow yourself to express yourself openly through sarcasm. You joke all the time. Yeah. You, you're unable to take things seriously because it feels too vulnerable. So you mm-hmm. allow for your opinions and ideas to show through humor, which yeah. can be a good thing. But when that becomes your default, again, people still don't know what do you actually think yeah because you know, there's an ambiguity yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's very ambiguous but a lot of the time it's it leans towards being aggressive mm-hmm. there's that aggression that's kind of mm-hmm. waiting to come yeah. out so it comes out in very passive ways and then you have aggressive you like to dominate conversations even if you don't mean to you get defensive very quickly you like to dominate conversations you find it difficult to take feedback. It kind of makes you angry. Yeah. Whereas with someone who might have more of a passive default, in getting feedback, they feel like they're wrong. There's a lot of shame around it. You know? So it's a good couple. It's a good match. <laughs> it's a good match. They often end up together, interestingly yeah. enough. <laughs> um, so again, we don't want to personalize this. If you find yourself that your default might be more towards aggressive. We just want to correct it. And we all shift and change. So the goal is assertive, I guess. The goal is assertive. Where you're grounded in your communication, you can accept feedback, you can give feedback, you consider people's feelings and their emotions, but you don't take them as a part of yourself. You have strong internal boundaries. And all of us are able to be assertive in the right environment. If we feel safe, if we are okay being challenged by a particular person, maybe it allows us to be a little bit softer where we don't see it as being yeah. weak, which if you have an aggressive nature, you think it's being weak to take the power of the pause, for example, yeah. or to be more yeah. quiet. Um, so responsibility is an important piece of unraveling self-censorship and mindfully expressing yourself because you need to be aware of how you're currently communicating. Mm-hmm. Is it working for you or against you? Yeah, yeah, ultimately? Interesting. yeah. So first, you are being honest with yourself. Mm. Then you practice with someone with good intention yeah. that you love. Yeah. And then you're free to go with your uh, opinions yeah. and uh, the way you think in a dinner. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'll add a little point around the practice. The whole point of, of those little micro practices in the awareness phase is because you want to see the truth of your communication style. Yeah. You know, you want to actually test it out while you're being a little bit braver. You want to see, okay, what is the truth of how I communicate when I'm challenged a little Mm -hmm. bit? Maybe I like to think that I'm assertive and I'm grounded, but it's only because everyone around me already agrees. Yeah. So when I'm in an environment, because it's easy, we're all assertive. (laughs) Of course we're all assertive and grounded. If everyone around you has the same belief, same worldview, same opinion, and then you go out into the real world where you're challenged then you shut down, you get defensive. Of course, yeah. Now more than ever, you give someone a label and it shuts down the conversation, you know. So you don't even have to deal with with your own discomfort because you can just hand someone a label and to call someone a name and that is it, conversation is closed. So you're not getting challenged. That's exactly why practicing in your interpersonal relationships has to be the testing ground and then you go online. So all of that really does work together the awareness piece and then the responsibility of understanding your communication style based on the data that you collected from actually testing it out as it is currently and then to see is it working for me 
or against me before you get to expression. So there's three pillars that I've given you so far. Awareness, responsibility, and then the last one is expression. Yeah, fantastic. What you really need when you do this to yeah. find the benefits? Yes. Uh, so what are the benefits like or oh. um, versus playing it safe? Mm. And as you usually do and you know yourself, yeah. it's fine. Like it's not working very well, but yeah. you know yourself like this with your little defaults and you're kind of uh, yeah. accepting yourself. What are the benefits of having all this uncomfort mm. and sometimes pain? What, oh, do you get, what do you get at the end? Yeah, that's a beautiful question because as human beings, we want a reward. If there's no reward, we're not going to do it, you know. Um, because currently, if you are someone that is in a place of self-censoring, the reward supposedly is self-protection. You don't yeah. have to get uncomfortable. It yeah. feels safe. It's familiar. Mm -hmm. There isn't that uncertainty. So I'm really glad that you asked that question. And for me, one of the biggest things as social animals that I see as a benefit and know to be a benefit from having have worked with thousands of people around this at this point in time is that it allows for you to connect. It allows for you to have deeper and more intimate relationships with people. We think that avoiding conflict within ourselves and other people means that we maintain harmony that couldn't be further from the truth. If you're my friend and I never really know what you truly think, there's a cap to how mm. deep we can go. Yeah, that's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Whether when it comes to joy or play or excitement, I want you to know that you and I can get a little bit controversial. Not in a way that is harmful or extreme, but in that very human way that allows for me to disarm myself and to be like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know your mind worked in this way. I yeah. didn't know you yeah. enjoyed that kind of humor, yeah. you know? We get to, to go deeper, but if we have this pretense that we're inherently mm. politically correct, yeah. which is a lie. Yeah. Human beings, whether we like it or not, we are so politically incorrect. My goodness. You just try going to my home, to Zimbabwe. You will see how a lot of this sort of, I, I think there's a cultural <laughs> thing as well. It goes out of the window. And you get to interact with real human beings who are compassionate, are empathetic, but they also allow themselves to be so many things than just a rigid, robotic perfection. Politically correct. And Politi uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I think the biggest thing for me, and there's so many other things, you know, I, I see it as a tapestry with so many different threads, but the biggest one that forms the entire tapestry is that it allows for you to have deeper connections. Mm -hmm. It allows for you to meet the right partner, the person that is truly aligned to your True. values. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're performing, you're going to attract friends, romantic partners, even clients and audience, or find yourself in a job that is so unfulfilling because you have to be in a performance every time you leave your home, you know? So it also stifles your self-trust. How can you trust yourself if you don't have anything that you think, feel, want to say that you don't believe is worth taking a risk for? Yeah. We have to be willing to take emotional risks. And again, you have a deeper relationship with yourself. You can trust yourself even more. And you have deeper connections with people. Yeah. And so it means uh, that, does it mean that you have to drop a bit of people uh, on the way? Like, because mm. when you make your uh, authentic coming out, probably some mm. people are not going to, uh, to love this or enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. But I, and, and I think that's a natural part of the process. And you know what, I, I also think that's going to happen regardless. As you age, as you experience life differently, maybe once you have children, you just view things differently. You don't enjoy the same conversations anymore. Um, you value your time in a different way. So naturally people drop off and other people enter. So I think sometimes we get yeah. over attached to the idea of, but I will lose people. What if you were to reframe that to, I will gain people that actually mm -hmm. align with mm -hmm. my values as they stand totally. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will gain friends that I don't yeah. have to perform for. Yeah, to focus know? on the good things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. There's a lot of reframing yeah. that we yeah. have to do with this, totally. you know, reframing the loss into the gains because the loss is inevitable yeah. regardless, you know. Reframing so is I think important the for you? Reframing, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think we can reframe everything? Mm, that's a good question. Um, Do I think we can reframe everything? I think you could with everything. 
because it's simply and again i i think there's a difference between can you reframe everything and should you reframe everything i think it, it can yeah. get into a layered conversation yeah. right but i think you can especially if it's something that's uncomfortable if it's something that um is tied to any kind of adversity or a really rough patch in life i think it actually depends your well-being depends on your ability to reframe when you need to absolutely absolutely it does it does and it's a choice how did you um do that because i know you've mm. been sharing and even in your podcast or yeah. in some other podcasts you've been sharing about uh, a lot uh, and in a beautiful way mm. about how you self-sabotage yourself so i don't know if you want to mention it here but it's Absolutely. such um, embodiment of what you're saying yeah. that uh, if you want to say how how did you do against yeah. uh, self-sabotage and what yeah. was the process and what it brought you absolutely uh, and you know what i i think that's a big part of this because even in my work and when i talk i never want people to think i'm speaking at them this is what you should do yeah 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 and you know you don't see any of me or my story or my journey as part of that i was led to the work that i do today because i was an addict for 10 years from the age of 14 up until 24 um and my specific destruction was wrapped around alcohol mm -hmm. it was binge drinking alcoholism and because of how young i was It was very easy for me to to almost get away with it because especially in the country that I'm in the UK it's seen as a rite of passage right you just drink yes. it's, everyone drinks and you know that's how you make friends yeah. that's how yeah. you make friends that's how you connect so again because we're social animals we'll look for connection in anything um so for me drinking very heavily from a young age was my was my vice It was my means of self-protection to suppress different types of trauma that I'd experienced as a child. It allowed for me to feel confident. It allowed for any insecurities that I had about my identity, my race, because I always say I discovered that I was black when I came <laughs> to the UK. I had yeah. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I I'd never had to think about it. So suddenly I was hyper aware of my differences and I was told that they were wrong. So in discovering something like alcohol, it could shut all of that away. Yeah. But then what also happened is that I trained myself to binge drink. So the same way of drinking just followed me regardless of the environment. You know, we speak about discernment, reading the room, knowing your audience. Something like alcoholism, it doesn't care what your environment is because you're trained to behave and to drink in the exact same way. So I was sabotaging myself before I even knew what that meant. It was just a pattern of self-destruction, yeah. a pattern of pathological lying, a pattern of denying just how big the problem was, a pattern of fractured relationships, reckless, compulsive, casual sex, which was all a byproduct of the way that I drank. But what was interesting is that I stopped drinking, finally. I mean, I relapsed seven times, but When I was 24, seven years ago now, I stopped drinking and I thought all of that was going to go away. You know, yeah. I thought the lying yeah. would just disappear. You must arise yourself. I thought I, yeah. Right. I thought the manipulating would just disappear. I thought I would suddenly have so many friends and people around me because now the alcohol was in the rear view. But no, I was faced with my own mess, which is why I'm so fascinated and, and really committed to understanding the human shadow. And I think there's so much beauty in it when you can look at it, which is why awareness is the first big thing. Mm, I had to look at it like a mirror yeah. without hiding, without smoking something, snorting something, drinking it away, um, having sex to avoid so I can feel some kind of connection. I had to look at it. And that's when I was thrust into the world of psychology. I've always loved reading. I've always loved exploring and understanding why do we do the things we do, you know? Um, and every time I'd relapsed before, it was because I, I believed that I was bad. I wasn't able to zoom out and see that I had a problem, which was also a brain-based problem, which was also an habitual training. I didn't have that objective language for it. So I thought I was bad. Yeah. So anytime that I got close to reaching two months or three months of sobriety, I would feel uncomfortable because suddenly I'm getting well and I wasn't used to being well. Mm. I was used to being a chaotic person. I was used to being unreliable. Um, so any time that I started to see the possibility of living a different life, I'd feel very uncomfortable and I'd relapse. 
seven okay. times that happened because you were more comfortable in what you knew like yeah. we said right. right at the beginning i yeah. was much more comfortable yeah. in that self-destruction it was familiar yeah. to wake up and to play csi what happened yesterday what's the you know it was normal than to wake up with a clear head knowing that i'd had a good night and i'd gone home at a reasonable time it just didn't feel like me you know yeah. so self-sabotage was my cycle for a decade and for that first year of getting sober finally it was really facing what the truth of who i i was was and also acknowledging that i didn't know myself at all so leaning into psychology eventually getting trained in it having the language of self sabotage understanding that it's self protection allowed me to sort of evolve my work to where it is now where um i i really want people to see that this is not a moral failing you know if something has come up in this conversation it's not a moral failing it's just being curious again and being like ha huh, isn't that interesting that i've been in this pattern since i was 15 and now i'm maybe in my 30s 40s 50s and i i just had a notice yeah. now that i know that means i can do something you know yeah yeah, yeah yeah so that's my personal experience with it how do you uh celebrate your uh, sobriety and your achievements mm. i I celebrate by allowing myself to play and to have fun again because those in that decade I didn't allow for myself to experience actual joy. So I find joy in the smallest things. In the smallest things, when I go for a walk with a friend, I do tea rituals quite a lot. Um even I was sharing this with a friend earlier, even the ritual of shaving my head every week feels incredible. Like I have these little things that I do um i have a lot of conversations with my friends where we explore just very either deep or really lighthearted topics things that i couldn't do or maybe did when i was drunk but i wouldn't remember it the next day <laughs> which was a yeah, huge thing that. people were like oh africa last night was in i'm like quick conversation <laughs> like i wish i was a part of that conversation so now i i really do cherish the simplest things the simplest yeah. things yeah Yeah. Do you have one favorite book or two favorite book that you would uh, advise to everybody? Oh yes, I do. The Untethered Soul by Michael A. Singer. Um that book encouraged me in a very indirect and beautiful philosophical way to stay sober because it allowed for me to know that at any moment you can take on the role of observing your experiences and you can shift them. It allowed for me to understand the power of the mind. and not in a very abstract um out of touch way but in a really grounded way um that's a book that i recommend to everyone okay. regardless of who you are regardless of whether you're turned off by somewhat spiritual language this book is phenomenal wow phenomenal fantastic yeah do you have um an advice that you received mm. uh, that uh was important for you yes it's one line and it's There is no such thing as failure, only feedback. Mm. Right. My it's, mentor. It's a good one. Like that. Yeah. Who who was your yeah. mentor? My mentor was an incredible incredible man who's passed away now. Um who was a spiritual teacher, a healer and I met him at a time where I really needed to be shown what it can look like to transform your life again in a way that is tethered to reality. Um and he's someone that i hold very dearly and he he told me that line very early on in us meeting there is no such thing as failure africa only feedback yeah very positive mm-hmm. wow mm-hmm. uh which advice um would you give to the young um mm. africa i always say this but rose she she wouldn't have listened so i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i'd have to make okay. something up because she would not she wouldn't have listened maybe The next best thing would be being at a bus stop and she's there waiting for the bus and the version of me that I am now mm. I end up at that same bus stop I'm waiting for the same bus and then we end up having a conversation Okay I'm I telling think you, you I can think do that it could be, yeah. I think that and I I don't think I'd even give her the you can do it I think the best lessons and what allowed for me to actually get and stay sober was not someone telling me that I can do it that I should it was seeing people who embody what it looks like to have fun without needing to drink 
seeing people who have been through the ringer and been in the pits of hell and they've been able to reclaim their lives. So for me, what really worked, and I see this for so many people, is to see someone living it than for someone yeah. to tell me. Yeah. It yeah. will get very close to uh, my last question. It's a question I'm yes. asking to everybody, the mm -hmm. harvest of the day. What's yeah. your favorite tool for transformation? Mm. Honesty. Yeah. Honesty. And honesty requires, on a very practical level, honesty is about asking yourself the right questions. And I find my favorite one to be, is it working for me or against me? I think you can use that with so many things. Many times a day? Many times yeah. a day. Yeah. I try not to okay. overdo it so it doesn't lose its, it's, its power. Its, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try it. Use it liberally. Three times a day. Max. max. Okay. <laughs> Honesty. Well, wonderful. I'll practice this one and I'll give, yeah. you, I'll give you feedback. Please. Okay. Fantastic. Please. Africa, it was uh, wonderful having you here in London and in this podcast for Harvest. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the day and thanks for uh, sharing your, your tools and your life and your mm. experience and your wisdom. Thank you. No, the Harvest family has been very, very kind to me and I'm very excited to just see where this conversation goes and the many other conversations that you've had. I, I think it's so impactful and it allows for people to see that there's so much room for exploration. So thank you. Thank you, Africa. <laughs> Thank you, it was beautiful. Big fan, big fan of you. Thank you.